Good afternoon, and welcome to the special lecture of the annual meeting of the National Academy of Engineering. This lecture is intended to connect engineering and social issues with the goal of stimulating discussion on how the engineering profession can address social problems in our society. I hope we will continue this lecture at future annual meetings because I think the engineering profession must recognize social issues and problems if it wants to contribute to the social good. It is a great honor for me today to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Brooks Slaughter. Dr. Slaughter's biography is available online uh, in the online program book, but I will quickly uh, note that he is a professor of in education and engineering at the Rossier School of Education and the Viterbi School of Engineering at the University of Southern California. A former director of the National Science Foundation, Chancellor of the University of Maryland College Park and President of Occidental College, Dr. Slaughter is well known for his commitment to increasing diversity in higher education with a focus on STEM disciplines. He has also served as President and CEO of the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, known as NACME. He has been a member of the National Academy of Engineering since 1982 and has served on the Committee on Minorities in Engineering and the Action Forum on Engineering Workforce Diversity. He was also elected to serve two terms on the NAE Council. In 2004, Dr. Slaughter was awarded the NAE's Bika Award for his support of engineering research and education as director of the National Science Foundation for his many contributions to the development of science and technology policy and for his lifelong dedication to increasing diversity in the science and engineering disciplines. This presentation today is entitled a call to action for racial justice and equity in engineering. There will be an opportunity for questions following his remarks. Please type your questions into the question and answer box and we will get to them at the end. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Slaughter with us and I now ask him to take the microphone. I want to express my appreciation to President John Anderson and to Percy Pierre chair of the Racial Justice and Equity Committee for inviting me to deliver the special lecture at this 2020 annual meeting of the National Academy of Engineering. I also want to thank the members and staff of the committee for their assistance in developing this address. I am honored and humbled to join you in this session. It is certainly no secret to anyone participating in this virtual annual meeting that we are living in one of the most crucial periods in the history of our nation. It is at least one of the, the most crucial periods, one of the most crucial periods of my lifetime. I was born in the waning years of the Great Depression and I was too young at the time to fully understand World War II, although I remember certain aspects of it. I was born and raised in Topeka, Kansas, and attended the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka Black Elementary Schools, and endured the discrimination and exclusion faced by Black and Brown inhabitants of that city. I have a vivid memory of the struggle for civil rights in this country, the tragic and violent deaths of Emmett Till, Medgar Evans, Evers, and Martin Luther King Jr., the Watts riots, the assassinations of the Kennedys, and the turmoil over the Vietnam War. I was a member of the commission chaired by Warren Christopher to investigate the use of force by the Los Angeles Police Department in the wake of the Rodney King beating and know the fear that black people have when stopped and interrogated by police officers. At this point in our history, we are faced with many critical and potentially cataclysmic events and crises. 
There are three that come to my mind immediately. The first is climate change, a global event that threatens the very survival and existence of our species and all other animal and plant species on Earth. In addition to the air we breathe, the water that sustains us, and the Earth itself. The second threat are the novel pandemics, which have the power to imperil our lives and dramatically change the way we live, work, and interact with one another. The third, and the one I wish to speak with you about today, is the one that jeopardizes our democracy, productivity, and well being, and puts into question whether we can all live together peaceably and harmoniously in a just and equitable American society. And that is the crisis caused by the ignominious history of racism and anti-Blackness, the unwillingness to acknowledge and accept the humanity of Black people that has crippled our nation for 400 years. A common thread that runs through each of these monstrous and intractable problems is the fact that engineers have a role to play in identifying and developing answers for their solution. The broad, demonstrative, multiracial, multicultural reaction to the tragic and senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Eric Garner at the hands and knee of police officers and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery by armed vigilantes has led to a wide variety of actions among the institutions that have expressed alarm and have pledged to work to not only identify and remove systemic and structural barriers to the inclusion and success of Black individuals in their organizations, but to also strive to improve the circumstances of Black Americans in the larger society. The names of slave owners have been removed from buildings at universities throughout the country. The statues of Confederate generals the stone ghosts of the South, as they were called by journalist Tremaine Lee, have been toppled. Among the institutions that have expressed allegiance to the Black Lives Matter movement and have vowed support for anti-Blackness efforts are professional engineering associations, honorary societies, and STEM-related organizations. Even NFL players or displaying signs that say end racism or Black Lives Matter on their helmets, shoes, and uniforms. All of these are extremely encouraging developments because far, far too long, many of the organizations and institutions that are now on board have been on the periphery of racial justice movements movements and have at most provided rhetoric little in the way of action in addressing the inequities, discrimination, and implicit biases that exist and persist in their midst. It is my intent in this address to point out why I believe that a cultural transformation is necessary in the profession of engineering and in many of its institutional arrangements and practitioners. If, if we are to participate meaningfully in the efforts to create a more racially just and inclusive American society. <clears throat> At this critical moment in our nation's history, we need more than words that renounce racism and anti-blackness. We need actions to abolish racism and anti-Blackness. Not only must we be mindful of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who wrote these words, the arc 
of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But also the words added by the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but only if there is dead past commitment to completing the task. When I was chancellor of the University of Maryland College Park, I co-taught a class in the African-American Studies Department. On the first day of the class, I went to the blackboard and I wrote what I somewhat lightheartedly referred to as Slaughter's Theorem. It read, Black studies is for white students. Math, physics, and chemistry are for black students. There's no doubt that I could have been accused of unbridled hyperbole at the time, but I believe what I had written. I believe it even more today. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, very sorry for the technical difficulty. We're having some video problems with Dr. Slaughter's connection, so he will be with us in audio only. So uh, we will still hear his talk, and I and thank you for being being patient, Dr. Slaughter. Thank you, John. I apologize for that, and I hadn't planned on that difficulty. Uh, I was at the point where I said that white Americans must come to understand and hopefully appreciate the lived experiences of Black Americans throughout the history of our presence in this country. The negative effects of the history of white supremacy are evident today in the COVID-19 pandemic in which Black Americans are disproportionately affected medically and economically. It is not hard to understand why the rise in the presence of white supremacists today makes us fear for the lives of our children and grandchildren. No longer should any of us accept the excuse, I don't know. White Americans must come to understand the harm that white supremacy has on them, just as it has on the Black people for whom it is targeted. In short, white Americans must come to understand what James Baldwin meant when he said, to be Black in America is to be in constant rage. And fittingly, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who declared, justice will not be served until the unaffected are as outraged as those who are affected. So long as some behave as though they are unaffected by the systemic and structural racism embedded in the manner in which our society has and continues to operate the meaningful and difficult conversations. The conversations not for the purpose of assigning guilt or blame, but rather to finding understanding, understanding and agreement will not occur. But they must occur if we are to rid ourselves of the fear of the other. The yoke that prevents us becoming a nation where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. And there is hopefully regard for the opinions of others. And engineers must be at the table where these conversations take place. We are also at a moment when the country can ill afford to ignore the talents that exist in those persons who have been historically underrepresented, underrecognized, and underappreciated in science, technology, and engineering. We must recognize that America cannot and will not maintain a prominent position in the STEM skills so long as anyone is prevented or impeded from the fullest possible opportunity to participate and contribute to our scientific, technological, and engineering activities and achievements. Our economy, productivity, and welfare of our citizens depends upon it. 
Given the inevitability of future pandemics and the current and impending consequences of climate change, our very survival depends upon preparing and marshalling all the talent we can possibly develop. We must then, as NAE member Nick D'Onofrio insists, make sure that opportunity is there to meet the talent. I have long contended that diversity drives innovation. Former NAE President Bill Wolf pointed out that sans diversity, we limit the set of life experiences applied. And as a result, we pay an opportunity cost, a cost in products not built and designs not considered, in constraints not understood, in solutions not offered, in processes not invented. He went on to say that members of a diverse group each experience life differently, and that these differences in experience constitute the gene pool from which creativity springs. And in the very same vein, his successor, NAE President Charles Vest said, a diverse technical workforce is more likely to, con to conceive, design, and develop products, processes, and systems that perform well in the marketplace. It is my belief that the discipline of engineering has to a large extent ignored these truths and failed to recognize or perhaps admit that diversity drives innovation. But mere diversity is not enough. While diversity is necessary, it is not sufficient to ensure that an institution practices equity and inclusion. As Stephanie Farrell, the 2018 president of ASEE said, Diversity is about counting heads. Equity is about making heads count. We must commit ourselves to make engineering a professional discipline that is an example of equity and inclusion. While the reality of what I have just mentioned applies to all those who have been prevented in one way or another from the opportunities to fully participate and succeed in the STEM disciplines. The situation has been particularly acute for Black Americans. For 400 years, anti-Blackness and crippling policies and practices of structural and systemic racism, often sanctioned by local, state, and federal policies and laws, have prohibited them from being viewed as equals in the realm of true Americans. While most Americans are aware of the many significant contributions that Black Americans have made in fields such as music, art, literature, and poetry, the same is not true for science and engineering. All too often, their achievements in these areas have been unknown or recognized, or if known, have been disregarded or denigrated. That was true for Benjamin Banneker, 1731 to 1806, a self-taught mathematician, clock builder, almanac creator, and surveyor, who assisted in surveying the original boundaries of Washington, DC, and whose astronomical observations and studies were devalued and discredited by Thomas Jefferson. It was true for Norbert Rilieu, 1804 to 1896, one of the earliest chemical engineers and inventor of the multiple effect evaporator. For Elijah McCoy, 1844 to 1929, engineer and inventor of lubrication devices for steam locomotives. For Louis Latimer, 1848 to 1928, who in 1881 was issued a patent 
for the process for developing the carbon filament for light bulbs. Prior to his joining Thomas Edison in 1885 in the design and creation of the first incandescent bulb. And for Garrett Morgan, 1877 to, to 1963, inventor of the three position traffic light. How many members of the Academy know that Mark Dean, a co-inventor of the personal computer, holds three of the nine original patents for the IBM PC? Or that James West invented the microphone technology on the cell phone you have in your pocket? Or that black engineers, doctors Yilda Balbino, Shirley Ann Jackson, Gary May, Daryl Pines, and Gregory Washington are presidents of some of America's most highly regarded research universities. Yes, Black Americans have been and are contributors to this country's might and capabilities in science, technology, and engineering. If we were to eliminate the systemic racial inequities that crush the aspirations and potentialities of so many Black Americans, our nation would not only be more just and equitable, but it would also have an even greater capacity for innovation and productivity. We must let opportunity meet talent. It is no secret that the field of engineering ranks well behind medicine, law, and many other professions when it comes to the commitment to and practice of social justice activities. For the most part, engineering education is not afforded engineering students with the exposure to the liberal arts and social science courses that would prepare them for seeing engineering in terms of its service to humanity. But I contend that the grand challenges of engineering, the 14 global problems identified by the academy, by the academy will require more than science and mathematics to solve. They will require a profound understanding of matters such as the politics, economics, cultures, languages, religions, aspirations, fears, and histories of the societies and people who will be affected by and who will be the users of the technologies developed by engineers to address and solve those problems. Engineers must have an appreciation for ethics and consider the questions of who benefits from and who is disadvantaged by the devices, machines, systems, processes, and organizations that we are responsible for creating. No longer should anyone tolerate the design of a highway, bridge, or light rail system that displaces a black neighborhood or business community to advantage white suburbanites on their commutes to and from the central city. Engineers need to recognize our social responsibilities in helping to make healthcare more affordable and available for the poor and underserved. Apply our critical thinking and problem solving abilities to the inequities in performance and success of minority children in our public school educational systems and address the critical problems that exist in our criminal justice, criminal justice systems. To do so, we must employ the engineering habits of mind that were formulated by the NAE and the NRC in 2009, being creative, working and negotiating in teams, adopting optimistic mindsets when problem solving and designing, thinking not only about individual technologies, but also about how the systems within these, within these technologies operate. And importantly, considering the ethical nature of engineering and its products. 
Speaking of the grand challenges, Racial Justice and Equity Committee member Gary May suggested that we add a 15th grand challenge of engineering, achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion. His suggestion was seconded by all. By the way, a few years ago, the National Science Foundation reported that research had shown that a larger proportion of black and brown K through 12 students aspire to become engineers than do their white peers. But at the same time, another study revealed that only 4% of black and brown high school graduates have taken the requisite courses to enroll in engineering study in college. This is due to the fact that many of these students have attended under-resourced schools in economically depressed areas, have lacked exposure to role models and mentors, and have faced discouragement from administrators, counselors, and teachers. I know this from experience because it happened to me and many like me in my generation that it occurred back then could be considered shameful. The fact that it continues today borders on the criminal. Corporate America has a major responsibility in ensuring that its structures and operations are free of discriminatory practices in hiring, promotion, and all employment procedures and policies. As a rule, the topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion have been absent from the board agendas of our major corporations. This is particularly true for Silicon Valley and many other high-tech companies whose record of racial justice can only be described as failure and who must come to understand their obligations in the efforts to eliminate the digital divide as well as the inequities inherent in the hardware and software that they produce. Corporations that employ engineers should provide substantial support to minority student organizations like the National Society of Black Engineers, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. They should also provide scholarships, internships, and summer employment opportunities to needy black and brown undergraduate engineering students to address the high cost of education. It is also important for corporations and industrial establishments to provide sustained support to minority serving organizations, such as the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, NACME, the largest provi private provider of scholarships for black, brown, and indigenous engineering students. The National GEM Consortium, GEM, which enables qualified students from underrepresented communities to pursue graduate education in science and engineering. The Advancing Minorities Interest in Engineering Organization, AMI, and the Career Communication Group's Black Engineer of the Year Award Program and BEA STEM conference, actions that would prove their commitment to racial justice and inclusion. Higher education is amid a perfect storm, consisting of a pandemic deemed to change forever the way colleges and universities operate, a society characterized by political partisanship, social and racial divisiveness, as well as the presence and impending threats of catastrophic climate change. How it responds to these wicked manifestations and the accelerating racial and ethnic demographic changes occurring in the nation will determine how it teaches and educates the leaders and productive citizens of tomorrow and who will be the recipients of that education. Although numerous encouraging transformations have taken place, 
I find many of the moralistic pronouncements by some of our most prestigious educational institutions in the wake of the recent Black Lives Matter demonstrations to be disingenuous and off-putting. A good friend of mine refers to them as virtue signaling. For too many years, these institutions have had the opportunity and the responsibility to address the structural racism that marginalizes Black Americans and deters them from the opportunities available to others, but have failed to do so. Given the increasing presence of black and brown students in the college age population, the concomitant decline in the proportion of white students, in addition to the potential decrease in international students due to the pandemic and changes in immigration policies, colleges and universities must diversify their undergraduate enrollees or ultimately close their doors. The same imperatives, regrettably, do not exist for graduate students and faculty. The dearth of Black, Brown, and Indigenous persons on the faculties of our major research universities is higher education's Achilles heel and its shame. This is particularly true for the STEM disciplines. While the presence of Black tenure and tenure track faculty in most large research universities harbors around 6%, it is 2% or less in science and engineering departments. Since in many engineering programs, 75% or more of graduate students are non-residents, these depressing figures are unlikely to improve. Our colleges and universities can and must do better. I hope they will develop the resolve to do so. Engineering schools can start by reaching out to historically Black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions to develop relationships with their faculties and students. They should be proactive in efforts to recruit a more diverse set of faculty members rather than waiting for responses to ads in academic journals and newsletters. They should find ways to inform and encourage Black, Brown, and Indigenous engineering undergraduates to consider graduate study in preparation for an academic career. They must recognize the importance of removing those structural impediments for their own organizations that discourage minority students and impair their ability to succeed. They must reevaluate their core values and become equity minded rather than deficit minded in their approach to ensuring a fair and equitable educational experience for all students. Importantly, they should focus less on being elite and instead strive to be excellent in the broadest sense of that word. Change must begin within. An important first step was taken a few years ago when Giannis Yorksos, the Dean of the USC Viterbi School of Engineering, spearheaded an effort that led to more than 200 engineering schools and colleges to sign a pledge to provide increased opportunity to engineering careers for underrepresented groups and to ensure educational experiences that were inclusive and that prevent marginaliz marginalization of any groups of people. They further affirm the importance of these aims as a reflection of their core values and as a source of inspiration for drawing a generation to the call of improving the human condition. What about the National Academy of Engineering? What must it do besides expressing its grave concerns about the treatment of Black Americans, addressing the structural racism that cripples our economy and productivity, 
and proclaiming its attempt res to resolve and examine its own operations, its policies and procedures, as well as determine how it can improve the circumstances of underrepresented and marginalized persons in society. It must be pointed out that the NAE has a long record of involvement in efforts to increase the presence of underrepresented minority students in engineering. At the behest of Percy Pierre, the same Percy Pierre who chairs the present day Racial Justice and Equity Committee, the Academy hosted a conference supported by the Sloan Foundation in 1973 a conference that led to the creation of what came to be known as the minority engineering effort and the founding of organizations such as NACME, GEM, and the Mathematics Engineering Science Achievement Program, MESA. This seminal event received strong support from the CEOs of corporations like General Electric, IBM, and DuPont and the presidents of major universities such as Purdue, Notre Dame, and MIT. Sadly, the same levels of financial support and interest from these bodies occur only episodically now, as attention to the topic of increasing minority representation in engineering has waxed and waned with changes in political administrations and economic fluctuations. At the beginning of the minority engineering effort, the Academy formed the Committee on Minorities in Engineering, which spawned several important initiatives, some of which continue today. At the beginning of the 21st century, NAE founded the Action Forum on the Engineering Workforce, and since then has supported the number of studies and research efforts that have been instrumental in illuminating the problems causing underrepresentation and have identified potential approaches to their solution. The Racial and Justice Equity Committee, an equity committee that President Anderson has formed, recently has been asked to consider a set of initiatives consistent with the NAE's mission, initiatives that will advance diversity equity and inclusion, both within the academy and in the larger community. It is the belief of the committee that a cultural transformation must take place within the engineering profession, including the NAE, if we are to provide a meaningful and sustainable contribution to the efforts to quell systemic and structural racism in engineering and in society. For this to happen, we must all remember that the NAE is us, each of us in this virtual annual meeting, all 2,250 plus members of the Academy. All of us must ask ourselves the hard question of, am I doing enough to help the discipline of engineering become a just an inclusive profession? And am I making sure that my work does not add to the inequities and injustices that abide in society? I believe that the events of the past few months where white supremacy and anti-blackness have been on display in ways not seen heretofore in the 21st century have opened a window of opportunity that we cannot afford to allow to close without making major strides in guiding the discipline of engineering toward becoming a more diverse, pluralistic, and inclusive profession. Furthermore, I feel a sense of urgency for us to do so. It is the kind of urgency represented by the no trespassing sign in the Kansas countryside. The sign reads, if you want to cross this field, you better do it in 9.9 .9 seconds. The bull can do it in 10 flat. I will conclude by simply saying that 
none of us can continue to, to hide behind the time word excuse of I am too busy. Instead, we must adhere to Martin Luther King Jr.'s mandate. We must use time creatively and always remember that the time is ripe to do right. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was uh, outstanding and a uh, wake up call. Uh, we're open for questions now and I will uh, ask that Katie, our senior program uh, manager, uh, to, uh, to handle the questions um, as they come in. So John, are you ready for questions? I am, thank you. Okay. Uh, Beth, do we have a question to start with? Yes, we have a couple of questions coming in and I, I had a question myself, Dr. Slaughter, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, you mentioned early on that um, white Americans must come to understand the experiences of black and brown Americans. I was wondering if you could give a few resources that you think white Americans can use to educate ourselves on these issues. Beth, I think, I think there are a, a number of books um, that uh, are available. Many of them are available um, through um, outlets like Amazon and so forth on this topic. This has be, become um, a, a, a subject that many people are, are writing about and uh, I, I think there should be no no difficulty in being able to to find uh, um, books about the history of uh, African Americans in, in in this country. If anyone is interested um, specifically in knowing more about the contributions that Black Americans have made in science and technology, um, they can find those books as well. There, there are. Uh, some that have been written by um, um, leading academics um, describing the history of some of the people I mentioned in, uh, in my speech, uh, Lewis Latimer, Garrett Morgan, Elijah McCoy, uh, Norbert Rilieu, um, all of those are available and I think can give some insight to this issue. Great, thank you very much. I have another question. At this time in history, where should we focus our efforts so it will lead to an engineering workforce that mirrors the nation's diverse population? I think it's critically important for us to recognize that young people in the elementary schools, particularly up to the fourth grade, are um, um, black and brown students uh, are doing uh, reasonably well in, in uh, math and science. It is unfortunate that uh, over time in, in, the, in the schools, um, their performance does not stay as high as it is in the, in the earlier levels. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not given the encouragement that they need to study math and science. And as I pointed out, many of them find themselves um, in a position where they haven't taken the courses. The courses either don't exist in those schools or they have not been directed uh, in the, to, uh, to take them. And I think it's critically Im important that um, we in the colleges and universities reach down to the elementary and secondary schools to, to provide the motivation and encouragement for the students and to, to help the teachers and counselors understand the importance of giving these students um, the advice that leads them to be able to pursue careers in engineering and science. But without that, I don't see that we're going to be able to make the progress that is necessary to uh, diversify the science and engineering workforce. Great, thank you very much. I have not, another question. In Africa, Black Africans lead in industry, government, and academia. How can we learn from them? I think we can learn a lot simply by recognizing the fact that uh, their governments 
um, are supportive. They, they, they've got the desire to to excel, and they have um, an infrastructure that is providing them with uh, uh, what is necessary to to excel and, and succeed in in science and engineering. There are countries like uh, Kenya and, and and Ghana that are making great strides in uh, science and technology. And uh, we in this country can learn a lot from the fact that uh, the support that is provided to, to particularly young people to, to encourage them to enter these fields and to be successful is something that we need to stress um, in the United States rather than making it more difficult for them to, to, uh, to be successful. Great, thank you. Um, I've got another question. I used to have a number of black students in my undergraduate engineering classes. That number has diminished considerably in the last decade. What can we or I do to reverse this trend? It is regrettable that we made some progress until uh, um, maybe seven or eight years ago and the numbers have declined and, and, and we've seen that. I think what needs to happen is that we need to once again help uh, um, industry and, and the government understand that it is critically important given the changes in the, that are occurring in the country with the, with the uh, um, demographic changes in particular. We, we need to, to get more support from those sources that can provide not only financial support, but um, encouragement and, and, and uh, um, mentoring for these young people. I, I am um, not at all pleased about the fact that, that uh, we cannot count on um, some of the same organizations and, and institutions that provided support uh, at the time at the beginning of the minority engineering effort. Um, that has had a crushing effect upon our ability to increase the numbers. We started out with the idea of achieving parity in proportion to the presence of black and brown um, people in this country, but it, we have fallen well short of that goal. And it's going to require a mobilization on the part of all of us to see that, that, that uh, we once again proceed in that direction. All right, another question. Thank you for speaking. I'm glad you brought up the topic of prestige. As a black mechanical engineering graduate student, I've been discouraged from doing work at the intersection of engineering and equity because it was seen as, quote, less prestigious and, quote, less worthy of pursuing. How do we combat this issue in academia? I think higher education has to realize that uh, we have to change the way uh, students are educated. It, there is too much emphasis on just math and science and not enough emphasis <clears throat> on, <clears throat> on all the other areas that uh, engineers need to be familiar with and to be able to introduce um, as they do their designs and, and development. I, I believe very, very strongly that uh, um, we have to have an infusion of a liberal arts education and engineering education. Whether or not that means that we have to increase the amount of time that uh, engineering students uh, spend in order to get their, get their degrees, or whether we just need to re invent the curriculum, something must be done. Um, and the fact that uh, young people now are beginning to recognize that uh, um, they want to have a broader education, I think is a important first move. And hopefully that will be something that, uh, that higher education takes seriously. I believe it is happening in, in, in many places. I'm beginning to see a a, uh, an increase in interest in doing so. But I think it must happen if we're going to 
as I pointed out, address the grand challenges. Great, thank you very much. Another question, uh, thank you, Dr. Slaughter. Are there organizations you would recommend where retired engineers could make a meaningful contribution to encouraging or mentoring people of color to follow a STEM path? Well, I think it would be um, very smart for retired engineers to become familiar with some of the organizations that I mentioned in, uh, in, my, in my presentation, uh, NACME, Jim, Amy, um, for example, all of whom have, have uh, strong connections with students in the colleges and universities. And I think, think retired engineers could make a great contribution by supporting the students um, that these organizations work with. And uh, all they would need to do is, I think, contact the, those organizations and opportunities could be made available to them. Great, and another question that's sort of similar. What is the best way to set up a mentoring or support system for underrepresented students when our faculty is majority or all white? Well, I believe that, that any member of the faculty who is, who is uh, committed and, and interested in providing help to students um, can provide uh, mentoring uh, opportunities. Um, I do believe, however, that it is critically important for us to have larger numbers of, of uh, black and brown professors in our classrooms and, and laboratories. There is no question that uh, minority students um, are more successful if they know that, that there are role models that have gone before them, that they can see that it is possible for them to be um, scientists and engineers because there are others who have pre preceded them. Um, and I think without increasing the numbers of minority faculty, we're going to have a difficult time seeing significant increases in the numbers of students who, who enter and are successful in uh, science and, and, uh, and engineering. But I think that uh, anyone can be um, a good mentor. All it requires is to care, to have empathy, uh, understanding of the, of the needs of the students and to provide that support when, uh, when it is required. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Dr. Slaughter, what ideas do you have on how we can change our admission policies into engineering colleges in ways that might promote, promote diversity, or do you think there is a problem with our engineering colleges admission policies at all? I don't think that there is a, a, a uh, problem with the admission policies if, if the institution is committed to the idea of reaching out providing um, um, outreach to schools, um, to secondary schools that have large numbers of black and brown students. Um, it requires um, some proactive efforts on the parts of the schools. You can't just sit back and wait for, for students to say, well, I think I'd like to, to consider engineering. I think we have to work with elementary and secondary schools and groom young people, make certain they take the right courses, uh, give them the mentoring and encouragement um, and motivation to, con to continue their studies in math and science. And I think then the admission issues uh, become non-existent. It's a matter of, of being seen as a welcoming place for, for uh, minority students to enter and to be successful. That's, uh, that, that's really the issue. Okay, um, and actually related to that, NSF's, NSF's Advanced Institutional Transformation Program has been successful in increasing the number of women faculty in STEM. 
What are your thoughts on the role of federal funding agencies and foundations in incentivizing institutional change for racial justice and equity? I think it, it has to be seen as a priority. I, and I, there's no question but what um, great progress has been made in higher education in terms of, of gender balance. The fact that there has been um, very little emphasis placed by uh, government and foundations on increasing um, um, minority faculty in our higher education institutions is one of the reasons that we've made such little progress in that area. So I think there has to be a, a, a compelling effort on the part of institutions that provide support to, to our, to, um, colleges and universities that uh, diversifying their faculties is critically important if in fact we're going to be able to increase the number of graduate students um, and those who can go on to ultimately become faculty members themselves. Um, without that push from uh, funding agencies and from, from uh, um, government programs such as the ones that uh, come from the National Science Foundation, we're going to find very little um, change in the current situation. Okay, uh, what message of hope and encouragement would you give to a young John Slaughter just entering the engineering profession despite what they see on the news? Well, I've always said that uh, one of the things I, I tell young people is don't take no from a counselor. Um, I, I faced that and too many young people continue to face that. And it's, uh, it's something that keeps us from, from uh, taking the steps that we should. I believe we have to have, to, to have faith that uh, um, we can achieve, we can be successful, and we have to overcome those obstacles that some people put in, in, in front of us in order to uh, uh, sometimes prevent us from, from moving forward. But uh, continue to believe, continue to dream, do not, uh, do not let, uh, barriers stand in the way of your um, pursuing those goals and uh, and you, you can be successful. I'm actually quite optimistic that uh, this current generation of young people are not only capable but desirous of overcoming those obstacles and that uh, we will be able to see an increase um, in, in their presence in uh, in, in our engineering schools. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, what might be done to counteract tendencies to reject education and industry applicants with African-American sounding names? Yeah. Well, it's again, I think important, as I pointed out earlier on in my in remarks for for those who would be inclined to, to uh, prevent anyone from um, pursuing a career in science and engineering simply because of their race or their color or the, or the way their name sounds, um, they need to, 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 to develop an understanding of the experience of, of these young people um, and, and their and their background and and, and overcome the tendency to to uh, um, to be discriminatory. Um, and it, it's we are going to have difficulty, I think, in changing the hearts of some people. But I believe that there are enough good people in this world who can who can see past some. Um, some of these things like 
uh, the way a name sounds or the color of the skin of, a, of, a, of an individual. And, and look, as, as, as King said, at uh, the content of their character rather than some of these meaningless things. Great, thank you very much. I have one final comment um, before we wrap up. This is not so much a question, but I wanted to read it. Dr. John Brooks Slaughter, leader in human being extraordinaire, has given us all so very much to consider, act on, and move on through his talk and throughout his life. It is now time for all of us to change what needs to be changed and take the actions needed to make a lasting difference today. It is this moment in time and not another that we need to drive our actions to change. We can no longer simply say, I am not racist. We must be anti-racist. Thank you, John. And that is from Nick D'Onofrio. Oh, thank you, Nick. You're a good friend. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Well, I'd like to, uh, uh, I can't top what Nick D'Onofrio just wrote. A wonderful closing. Thank you, uh, member Nick D'Onofrio. But, uh, this has been an excellent discussion. It's just a beginning, not anywhere near the end, and I hope it will motivate us to think more about uh, the issues raised by Dr. Slaughter. Uh, again, I thank John Slaughter for taking the time to share his insights with us, and I also thank the audience for hanging in there with us during these technical problems. I think in the end, we had a wonderful discussion, and let's leave keeping these thoughts in our head and moving forward and doing something about the situation. So I wish you all a, a great evening and uh, thank you for being with us. Good night.